Another critical theme that is defining our industry into the future is, of course, ESG. Those three letters that you've all heard so often. But what's exciting about this next panel is a tool that really helps companies wrap their heads around it and really make progressive strides and embed ESG thinking into their corporate thinking. The thought leadership panel is called Bringing Together Investors and Corporates to provide a credible means to track ESG in the mining sector. And I welcome my colleague, Mark Borbis, who runs the Talent Solutions side of the Glacier Resource Innovation Group and has become a bit of an ESG expert himself. EduMine runs some fantastic courses on ESG, recently did its own conference highlighting ESG issues. Mark, welcome to the Global Mining Symposium. Thanks, Anthony. Happy Let to me be give, here. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. And let me tell people a little bit about you. Now, Mark Borbis is the, as I mentioned, he's the, he's the, his official title is VP of Talent Solutions for Glacier Resource Innovation Group. And he's responsible for all of our online education and hiring solutions, which live under the EduMine brand, and the Northern Miner Career Minds brands, which are fantastic platforms. And I'm sure you already know about them, but if you don't, go check them out. Now, Mark is a committed lifelong learner himself. He's a voracious reader. He has over 20 years of experience in bringing new products to market and running high potential teams. He's joining us from the West Coast of Canada. He has two kids and he keeps himself busy when he's not running the Talent Solutions team by renovating things and writing and keeping a healthy mind and body, all that good stuff. So Mark, we're, we couldn't think of anyone better for on our team to sit down with Jamie Strauss. So I'll let you introduce Jamie and we look forward to finding out what uh, Digby is up to. Great. Thanks, Anthony. Yeah. In, in the lifelong learning category, my lifelong learning last night was how to put soffits up underneath the roof. So uh, if anyone's ever done that before, you can sympathize with me a little bit. All the layout was tricky. And then once we got going, we were fine. So yes, always learning. Um, well, welcome to the, the ESG discussion. And joining me is Jamie Strauss, who's the CEO of Digby. Um, Digby is an on-demand data research and ESG disclosure platform for the mining industry. So welcome, Jamie. Uh, good morning or good afternoon with you, uh, uh, Mark. Nice to see you. Yeah, great to great to have you here, Jamie. And I have had a chance to catch up, and I think we're we're in for a really interesting discussion today. Digby's got a really unique view on the ESG space, and and maybe before we get too deeply into it, um, Jamie, I'm going to get you to tell us a little bit about yourself and about uh, Digby to begin with. And I know you got a couple of slides. Maybe we want to bring up here as a, a bit of a backdrop as well. So sure. Okay, so uh, just while I get these slides up, so uh, uh, thanks, Mark, and thanks, Northern Miner, for uh, having us both on today. Uh, what a great conference, and particularly loved Ken's con uh, uh, speech uh, a couple of hours ago. So uh, uh, thanks very much indeed. Um, a little bit of background on me is uh, I've been about 30 years in the mining finance world, uh, based in London, um, but very much involved in Canada, and I'm on a number of different boards in Canada, many of which are, are kind of well-known, like uh, Goldstone Adventures and Altus Minerals. Um, uh, but it was Digby uh, 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 that is the talk for today. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, put up the, uh, uh, the slides, which I hopefully are here. Um, Laura, is that good? Yes, it looks perfect. Okay, good. So uh, maybe I'll just try and make that a bit bigger. Does that one work? Even better, you're a pro at this already, Jamie. Thank you very much. So, um, so the, uh, the, the Digby is a data research and uh, ESG disclosure platform. Um, but today's talk really is about, uh, about ESG. So we'll just focus on that. So very simply, uh, the, the, the ESG uh, platform is what it says on the tin. It's, uh, it's an ESG disclosure platform for the mining industry specifically. It's right-sized. Uh, so we have an exploration, a development, and a producer framework. Uh, it's uh, future-looking. Uh, it's Most importantly, it's aligned to the key global standards out there. Um, and almost as important as that is it is endorsed by some of the leading stakeholders of our industry. 
Uh, you can see just a couple of snapshots of the uh, system here. So there's a, 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 a question, a questionnaire which covers both corporate as well as uh, specific project questions, uh, where the obviously the question is there, the answers uh, can go in there, evidence to support those answers, um, and then uh, in terms of the output of this, you've got the uh, internal benefits and the external benefits. From the internal benefits, uh, you get a report back. It can uh, uh, will come to a number of different areas, but there are schools involved. Uh, within this, both at the corporate level, the project level, uh, some narrative behind it. Um, and then on the external benefits, these get put up onto the uh, platform uh, where they can be uh, credibly uh, uh, viewed or uh, credibly tracked, I should say. Um, and, and most importantly, uh, I don't want to go too much into the detail, Mark, uh, at this stage, uh, but you can see a direction of travel as well. Um, and lastly, it's really important also to make sure that we look at, con uh, look at projects on a context-driven basis. Um, so um, you can see from here, you can specify which companies, if you're a fund manager, you want to compare and contrast against based on the project context. So that's a kind of very brief uh, snapshot uh, of, of it. And um, I'll, I'll come back to you. That's great. Thanks, Jamie. No, it's good to... It's always nice to put a little bit of the reality behind this and show what it actually looks like. And I think as we get into our discussion, we'll get into a little bit more about what's going on um, behind the scenes here, which is kind of the most important part. Um, you know, obviously you can't turn around without hearing the acronym ESG these days. Um, it's a really important shift in the industry. Um, but as you and I have talked about, it's, it's complex and it's challenging for everyone to wrap their minds around. Um, I was on a panel, I think you were on a panel last month for Raw Materials uh, Summit as well. And one of the speakers in the, the track I was on talked about complex problems versus complicated problems. And I thought it was such an interesting framing of, of the world. You know, complex problems are about understanding the system and its various impacts. And ESG is a brilliant example of a complex problem to solve. Complicated problems require precise step-by-step -step analysis. Now, as a mining industry, we're we're good at complicated problems. That's <laughs> that's kind of our bread and butter, right? We can solve those. We have great ways to do those. The complex problems are a little trickier. Um, and when we spoke last week, you referred to 42 different global standards for ESG. Um, I didn't know if you know, coincidentally, that's the, the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything, if you're a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fan. So I don't know if that was an accidental global number that we came to or whether there was some universal design behind that, but, uh, but it, it points towards the, the complex problem that ESG represents. And I think that's something you guys are really tackling. Um, maybe you could approach this from the explorer, developer, producer side. What are some of the big pain points that you're seeing for explorers and developers and producers with respect to ESG? Okay, that's, that's a really good question because it's quite extensive, but it's almost, yeah. almost we've got to kind of reverse it actually a little bit. And, I agree it's complex because the world has made it complex. But actually, if you think at the heart of ESG, it's actually common sense. The problem is, is how do we disclose it? How do we move mm -hmm. it to a means to get through those 42 different standards? How do we effectively come out with something that can be used practically, uh, that can, is not a compliance tool, is, uh, but is actually where, where action is taken on the ground and where people can grow in confidence? And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned all of the different status levels of the of the industry explorers developers and producers because this this affects all of us it affects every company in the world private or public and more and more so as time goes on um, but i think it really comes down to and 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 it was an example that i had when i was approached initially to come up with a solution for this by a number of institutions financial institutions and i was going through the same issue on a board that i was on is to okay we're going to handle ESG, we're going to go forward with ESG, but when you Google it and everything, it just comes up with this myriad of things. What do we disclose? Uh, where mm. do we disclose it? How do we disclose it? And, and then when you kind of get through that, the bandwidth necessary internally uh, and the resources available for most companies probably listening on this great conference is who, who addresses that and how, how can we get them to do this without it being a compliance function and just putting it under the table, how can we actually do it, embrace it, and therefore get recognized as a, as a management team um, and get the benefits of this, not just in terms of local stakeholders, 
uh, uh, and our involvement on the ground, but also wider afield. So the pain points really are, what do we disclose? How do we disclose it? Where do we disclose it? And how can we make sure that we provide something which uh, the team we have at the moment inside the company can handle and do so uh, within, with efficiency? Okay. No, I think it's interesting. There's kind of two, two parallel themes there. One is just the, the bandwidth. How do we make this, this mm-hmm. achievable um, without making it a checkbox activity? And I think that's the other piece that you're kind of getting at. Is, Absolutely right. Yeah. Is, is, and we'll come back to that. How do you actually embrace it as an organization and what's the value in doing that? Um, when we Let's kind of turn our lens for a second to some of the investors and other stakeholders who are also a part of the symposium. And they're trying to make sense of all these various standards and disclosures and trying to stack company A against company B operating completely differently, different geographies. Um, how do they do that? And how do they actually assess companies in the industry as a whole? What, what does that look like? What are some of the pain points and challenges you see there? Well, I think your, your final point actually on that last question is one is I think you know, society has spoken and checkbox mm. exercise for this just isn't going to do it. Uh, and to some extent, you know, I don't want to get maybe deep into the world of greenwashing going on within the major global uh, uh, ratings agencies that is going on. But how do you ask those pertinent questions so that the fund managers, the stakeholder, any stakeholder uh, can effectively get that? I mean, if you look at it at the moment from both mining company and, and investor, there's huge inefficiency going on. Um, the, the miners mm. don't know what to disclose and the fund managers um, all going to the same goal. They want to effectively apply this ESG thing but they don't know how to get it. It's almost become a bit competitive in some sense. So there's a lack of standardization, uh, which of course means there's a lack of meaningful comparison, which therefore means you lose the whole benefit of ESG when it's applied properly. Um, uh, so there's a, there's a credibility gap for those few companies that are measured by the larger, by the, the, the ratings agencies. There's a credibility gap there. So, so this sector has a big problem, whether you're an investor or a mining company, uh, you, we have a big problem with credibility, I guess, generally, um, and, and inefficiency and a lack of standardization, which means we're not getting the benefit of ESG, which I see. And I think I don't, I, I don't see this as a, as a sole person. I think many people see this. This is the silver bullet that the industry has been looking for uh, for decades, where if we can come together, embrace this, we can see out into the future really quite a dynamically positive impact on the sector as a whole, both in terms of uh, local stakeholders, uh, in terms of uh, society as a whole, uh, environment. I heard positive, uh, the Natural History Museum at the same conference you were, on, uh, you were on last week, probably before you woke up, I don't know if you had a chance to see it, but the Natural History Museum came out with a study where they believe there's a possibility of nature positive at mine sites. Now that to me is, is hmm. it, it was, it would never have been possible to talk about that uh, just uh, two, three years ago. And I therefore think we can really start to bring this industry up. But yes, lack of standardization, inefficiency, and therefore a lack of meaningful comparison, which means we're missing most of the people that we can go out and reach out to in, this, in, the, in the fund management world at the moment. One of the ways that I, one of the things I like about the way you talk about this is there's always this sort of inside outside view. There's the inside view, which is this is about inefficiencies. And, and if there's one thing that can bring an operator and an investor together, it's a hate of inefficiency. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. But also the credibility and the overall impact side is, is the second piece of this. And I think mm-hmm. it's, it's nice the way you're always kind of joining those together. Um, uh, now, your dirty little secret is you've been an investment banker for a long time. It's not really a dirty little secret. It's kind of open knowledge. Um, but for most of your career, um, you know, my experience with investment bankers is it's, it's, unusual for you to step into an operating role you know mm-hmm. you kind of get that love of the transaction that love of the deal and that's what what sort of feeds you and keeps you going um but here you are in an operating role so what what was it about digby what what made you go yep yeah, this is the one i'm going to jump into well it, it, it almost sounds rather crass but i i genuinely wanted to give something back to this industry and initially it wasn't esg esg came latterly uh, but I wanted, I, after 20 years of experience in the sector, you kind of know its warts and its uh, problems. And, and, and I'm a huge believer in the mining industry. 
I was then and I am even more so now because I know what this industry can do to uh, the world in its transition to a sustainable future and a low carbon economy. Um, but I did know the warts and I think we all accept the fact that this industry can do better in many ways. And initially with Digby, uh, I, I came up with this idea that if we could understand the 43101s a little bit more, and if we could understand it in plain mm -hmm. language, and right. we were able to provide peer analysis and mitigate risk on a wider basis uh, at a lower cost, then we could bring in more pools of capital. So that was the initial uh, uh, view I had, and I wanted to be involved in, 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 I don't know, you could say a real business because you're not dealing with the last transaction and then as an investment banker, but I wanted to effectively have a sustainable uh, uh, approach to mining which then led on to uh, me being approached by a number of big institutions last year uh, to use the platform that I'd put together uh, to come up with uh, an ESG solution and to try and address some of the problems we're talking about today. Okay. Yeah, and that's actually that's a good segue because you're, you're releasing this disclosure tool over the course of this year. Um, and maybe that's, that's a good point to kind of connect back to some, we've talked about some of the challenges already, some of the pain points around inefficiency just around the um the amount of bandwidth this takes mm -hmm. to, to to get into you want to talk a little bit about how the esg tool you're releasing actually closes that gap yeah well um in a, in a way a platform you know feeds all sides and of, of, of a circle um mm. so um you know i'd love to say it in one quick sentence but it's it's just not really possible to do that but i mean <laughs> Um, the most important thing is it takes out the guesswork. Um, you okay. know, as, 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 as one of my um, wonderful employees said earlier today, is imagine, imagine being given a, uh, uh, being asked to uh, bake a souffle and having never done it before. I mean, where do you start? I mean, you've got absolutely no idea of the ingredients or the, the time that you're going to need to put it in the oven when we all know we're going to get it wrong. And just being given that, uh, that list or that recipe to know what to do improves the efficiency um, dramatically. And it, well, probably makes it a, an edible souffle rather than an inedible souffle. So, um, but effectively it's, it's taking out the guesswork um, and um, uh, the, the efficiency of the whole process, but, but for all sections, we've kind of touched on this, for the companies to know what to do, for the investors, uh, that they're not having to fight over different uh, frameworks or whatever, or, or trying to compare and contrast different uh, uh, frame, global standards out there, that it's all on one and they compare and contrast easily and they can see improvement from one year to another. Um, but it's also mm -hmm. other stakeholders. It's not just investors, it's insurance companies, admittedly more for the larger companies. It's the local stakeholders who can have freely access this data. Uh, and therefore you can have a meaningful engagement with your local stakeholders on a transparent basis. Um, standardization and, and, and a credible means to score has huge, um, uh, it, it creates huge opportunity. I mean, a gap analysis at management level to know whether they're missing certain areas and therefore they can improve. For board oversight, uh, for the compensation committee to include 20, 30 different ESG topics into 15% of the scorecard is impossible um, on an objective basis so that we can achieve that. Uh, corporate governance is becoming more and more of a, of, of a relevant area within ESG. So uh, to make sure that that and also the audit uh, risk committee or the audit uh, uh, risk role can be addressed through having uh, a meaningful report back to them, which has been independently assessed. Um, and I think almost it's probably not the most important thing because that so many of the things I've said already are demanded today and are increasingly becoming regulatory in terms of the board of directors. But the one I really like is encouraging younger people to come into the mining industry. You know, I think a lot of people will know the website, um, um, is it Glassdoor, uh, where you can go on and see if the employer is a good employer or a bad employer or whatever. This is a similar way for young people to identify companies that are embracing ESG. And that's the important thing. Nobody should be worried about a single score mark. Fund managers aren't bothered about um, 
a, whether a company is X or Y, what they're interested in at the moment, maybe it will change over time, is that these companies are embracing ESG and they're beginning to take action on the ground uh, in a real sense and in a, in, a, in a live sense to kind of go forward and improve. And I think if we can do that, we can, we can encourage uh, the younger generation that this industry is not maybe as negative as some people uh, perceive it to be. One of the things that, that I, I like about what you're doing is you're taking something that could easily be a scorecard, scorekeeping exercise, and you're looking at it in a much broader context. You're in trying to figure out how do you actually make that information useful for all the people that might mm -hmm. want to look at it, everything from a new graduate trying to decide, do I go into software engineering or mining engineering, all the way through to a, a, you know, a board of directors just trying to make sense of how is this business actually functioning from a risk and a responsibility standpoint. Yeah. Um, you know, I have a long background in the software business and everyone always talks about secret sauce. And to me, it, it sounds like the secret sauce in Digby is, is the fact that you've, you've taken these 42 frameworks and you've actually made it manageable, you know, and that's the, that's the secret sauce, if you will. Yep. Um, absolutely right. I mean, it's a matter of how can you, uh, well, Newton Asset Management actually first came up and said, the great thing about this is it's aligned to the global standards. Nobody's saying you've got to do SASB or GRI or World Gold Cup. So what they're saying is embrace ESG, do it on the ground and move it forward and make sure from my perspective that that can be credibly tracked because then I think you start to improve confidence. Yeah. And so, you know, we, we talked a lot about the different stakeholders looking at this data. How do you sort of start to quantify um, some of the improvements you're going to get? You know, efficiency is an easy one. We can measure productivity and number of people involved in time and everything else. But are there other factors there that you look at as well? Well, I think, I mean, I think the first thing is, is credibility. I mean, it's not necessarily can be defined, but I think credibility of this is the most relevant part for people to feel comfortable that we have designed this. We didn't trip across this. This was designed very specifically to address the underlying issues that are there, uh, the issues that we have spoken about. Excuse me. And so we needed to make sure that we had the right people on board uh, to support this, both internally, but also externally. So internally, we have uh, the wonderful Elaine Dawood King and Rich Borden, who are head of ESG at Newmont and Rio Tinto Copper and Diamonds. Um, and then, as, as you mentioned earlier, Satala, who have helped us uh, in designing these. And, but in addition to that, it's the support of the engagement and testing by so many banks, uh, by the fund managers, BlackRock, BMO, uh, Newton, um, uh, uh, um, I'm forgetting now off the top of my head all they are. So, but I mean, um, uh, Orion have been absolutely fantastic. Um, sector investments and uh, some of the other groups in the UK who, who have really helped us, generalists as well as specialists. Um, and so the, these companies have been critical to making sure that it's fit and proper for us. But to come back to your question about efficiency, I mean, other than that, knowing that this is a credible uh, uh, platform with which companies can have confidence that they're going to get, be able to get the rewards from it, uh, because ultimately, if you're not going to be rewarded, why are you going to do it? It becomes a compliance function. So um, time is obviously the most important thing in terms of efficiency, um, knowing what to disclose. I was talking earlier today to a, a prospective client of, uh, of ours, uh, a, a company is actually a private company, um, looking to list later this year uh, and about to come out with a PFS. And they've said, and this lady is a permitting specialist and has been given the job of ESG, which is one of the big problems. Nobody mm. quite knows who's going to handle ESG. So that's right. another uh, problem. Um, and she says, look, I've been doing permitting all my life and it's, it's a prescribed process. It's really easy. Yeah, it's not really easy. I mean, you've got challenges, but you know what to deliver. In the, in the case of ESG, she said, I've got this task, but I have no idea what, what content I need to do. And then when I'm asked to do it, it, you know, with two weeks to go before the annual report or the MIC, I, I've got nothing to track. I've got nothing to do. And you're pulling something together. And therefore you don't come out with the result, which is going to be of any good to anybody. So it, it is so much around this uh, efficiency, but also knowing what to disclose. Um, and then ultimately having credible scores, which people can rely upon to track, not so much a, whatever that single score is. 
but to track it over over a period of time and make sure that ch- things are changing on the ground. Right. Yeah, and that's where that some of the the rate of change graphs that you were showing are really important yeah. in terms of being yeah. able to see where you're coming from. And um, and, and I might just add, Mark. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, it's really important also for, you know, not only people should not be concerned by a single score, but we actually allow companies to hide their score for up to 13 months so that okay. they can do that second score and then get a direction of travel. And that's a really important uh, confidence booster because nobody's going to start off as a triple A company. This is a new journey for every company sector uh, and to some extent government in the world. So we need to start this and move it in the right direction and give people confidence that this is gonna be uh, interrogated, so to speak, in the right sense rather than the wrong sense. Right, no, that is a nice measure to build build confidence. Um, maybe just kind of a final question, thinking about the tool itself. Um, where are you at specifically in releasing the disclosure tool? You know, I, I'm sure there's some people here who probably wanna check it out right away. Um, how can people start checking out what you guys are up to? Yeah, so uh, I, I should add that the technology side of it's still in beta. So, um, so for another four or five weeks. So any company that wants to get involved in this, uh, the exploration framework is live. It's ready. To, it, it's being used at the moment. Uh, so they just need to reach out to me and I can give them access to it. Uh, we should be off beta within the next four or five weeks or so. Um, the development framework, which is uh, PFS level up through to producing, uh, should be out in the next two or three weeks. It's going through final testing with the, the bank's private equity guys, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and so we should be able to make that live in early November, uh, early, early June. And then our producing framework should be out by the end of September. Um, these scores will obviously slowly come onto the system. They're not there yet. Uh, we've only launched back in March. Um, and, and I should add, if anybody wants to uh, uh, follow us, then just go onto social media. Uh, you know, we, we upload things into uh, LinkedIn and Twitter all the time, or even sign up at Bigby, which is a, a free signing up process. And we keep people in touch with our, with our rollout. Great. Okay. So let's, let's shift directions a little bit. Um, as Anthony mentioned on the outset, I run the Edumine education business. We hosted in the ESG event last month. Um, and I think one of the themes that the panel and the participants kept coming back to was this need for culture change uh, around ESG. And I think, you know, that's, that's to some degree the holy grail. In fact, one of our panelists um, from Sarah Gordon from Sitarla is heavily involved in the work you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think for a while now, ESG has been, you know, this, this sort of quiet compliance activity to some degree. And quiet is maybe not the right word, but definitely a compliance focus initially. And, and you're certainly broadening that. Um, but given that that thinking needs to sort of permeate the organization, um, I know it's an area you think a lot about, what role do you think culture change plays in the ESG puzzle? And, and why is it so important that you start now as a company on that, that culture journey? Well, I'll give you, I'll give you a story that's since I- Oh, oh Jamie, Jamie, you accidentally went on mute there. You just went so on mute. Not quite so. sure how, but um, <laughs> that's ma- the magic of ESG. Um, so I'm not. I'll, I'll tell you a story, um, which uh, happened, and I think it was yesterday. I was talking to one of the big engineering consultancies in mining, and I was talking to this lady, and she was just saying, "Wow, I've got an Asian client. Um, in fact, a number of Asian clients, and at the board level." They're completely committed to ESG because they know what's coming down the train. They know what's happening to them. Um, But it's fascinating that as opposed to, I suppose, some of the more uh, Western uh, companies is they have been unable at this stage to move that down below board level into the management, not well, maybe management, but not into the, onto the ground. And it's really important, I think, for people to understand that this is not just a com- this is not a compliance tool, and you're absolutely right that it was probably seen as a compliance tool in, or a compliance process in the old days. Um, and you know, I think I think what really showed us up this was was last year. And you know, Rio Tinto, who was famed for its ESG, uh, then had its disaster uh, in Australia. And I think that was not by me, but by a lot of the experts. They were waiting for that to happen because. Mm. There were lots of policies 
that were being put out in place, but there was no action being done to those policies, or there was a lack of action being <clears> done. <throat> and the action happens in that culture that where it, it, it's got to get into the company and go all the way down to, to the bottom line. Now, I'm not an expert on what happened at Rio Tinto, uh, and you know they, they, they've done a lot of good as well. But I think it's important to use that example because I think that was the, frankly, and rather um, ironically, is probably the biggest single positive change that has happened in this industry where everybody's suddenly woken up that, the, that this has got to be in, in interbred into the company, into the people, for people to understand it. And we used a great example yesterday with our, um, one of the clients that came out uh, with, with the Digby uh, report is that we, they're going to actually use the tornado chart of scores and relating to a specific project and put it onto the site, down at the site of that project, so that people who are dealing with the water, might be the water quality or whatever, which is the weekend, knows that it's them which is holding back the company's overall score, which then is impacting ultimately the cost of capital and the potential investor process, which then ultimately leads to all the other bits and pieces going on. So I really think we do need to change the culture. It's, things don't happen overnight. They're not going to happen over a year or two years. But I think there is uh, really good evidence from this sector, which I find hugely encouraging, that this sector wants to get on board with ESG. I've seen very, very little pushback. Um, mm -hmm. And I think everybody <clears throat> gives this industry a bad name. And I, I think the perception is, un it is what it is, but it's unfairly warranted. Um, because I think there is a sea change happening in this industry. People want to get on top of this. They want to embrace it. They just need to be guided how uh, and, and, and to be given the, the means and, and the ability to do so um, uh, and allow that to then permeate the whole way through the company. No, that, that makes sense. And it, I, I love that example of, of, of making it more transparent and making it and, and, and actually, you know, helping people understand how what they're doing actually contributes to or detracts from their, their position. Because you sort of rule that all the way up and that again comes back to your point around credibility of, you know, if you start to make decisions like that and implement things like that on the ground, it's going to contribute more to the credibility of the organization. Because not only then is it, do you have a great ESG report, but it's if I pick someone off the street and ask them how yep. they're doing at a particular site, they can actually tell me about it. And, and I think Absolutely. That's and, 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 and I think to that extent, if you ask yourself, um, you know, the, the main rating agencies, you know, we're never going to get out of the bottom of the E and the S, um, as Standard & Poor's have put it, uh, where we mm. are first equal last uh, with oil and gas. We're never going to get out of that if we just rely on the global ratings agencies. Um, you know, the one size fits all, black boxed, um, algo driven kind of scoring doesn't really, um, is not going to pull this sector with all of its nuance out of it. And we need that transparency. We need that slightly different approach. We need to ask those pertinent questions that are being asked, not just of where we are now, but where this management team for any company may want to go in the future. And I think that will help the whole culture kind of move forward and bring the sector. Uh, to a new area. I think one of the the um, kind of unique viewpoints you have as a longtime investment banker is obviously into funding and how money moves and where it comes from. And, and obviously for some people on, on the symposium, that's ultimately what makes the difference. Um, and I think you've got a pretty strong case that the better ESG management and disclosure can actually change the funding picture for a company. Yep. Um, and I think I'm, I'm curious about that. I think that's a good area to explore a little bit more. So how, how do you get access to different pools of money or more money by doing ESG better? Well, I, I, I'm glad you've asked that again for all different stages of the, of, the, of, of the industry because the operating companies are feeling it already. I mean, this isn't something we've got to look down the line for. They're seeing it in their cost of capital is beginning to get impacted uh, by... Uh, I mean, you've got to look a little bit through the weeds because of the bull market in commodity prices, which is mm. obviously having an impact as well. But the cost of capital between one company and another is having an impact. I mean, look at Glencore's price versus uh, uh, Glencore's cost of capital against others. And I mean, it's, you know, it's black and white. So um, it is happening. It is having an impact. Now, with regards to developers, 
in a way, Mark, it's been going for a while. You know, the equator principles had a big positive impact for this industry as a whole when it came to debt. And um, so I think from that point of view, um, up until now, you know, it's been very much debt rated. But now you talk to any of the private equity guys, um, whether they're issuing debt or equity, then these groups, um, you know, ESG is at the top. As soon as you identified the resource and you're looking to develop that, ESG is right up there. Now, it's a fairly inefficient process and probably not as um, executed as well as it potentially could be in a, in, a, in a perfect world. But it's if you don't have the right credentials on ESG, you're not going to get financed or you're going to pay more than you otherwise would have done. And when it comes down to explorers, um, look, it's probably not an absolute requirement today, uh, if we're all being honest with each other. But I have no doubt that the, you know, you tell me a big institutional <clears throat> group is not effectively including sustainability or ESG or whatever acronym you want to use as part of their overall compliance process in terms of going forward. So to some extent, all funds, institutional funds are becoming sustainable in one way or another. Um, and in time, you're simply not going to be able to raise money or you're going to have a smaller pool of capital uh, to access if you're not embracing ESG. So it's... To, from that point of view, I think it's relatively straightforward. Um, I think the other thing to probably mention on this side, the sell side is behind the curve on ESG. Um, I think they accept that themselves. And the sell side, I'm sure, when it comes to research, I mean, the insurance industry and, and us are talking to each other about how we, they can use uh, DIG BSG in order to improve pricing and also mm -hmm. uh, talk about capacity of, of risk. Equally, I have no doubt that the sell side research will effectively start to incorporate research, uh, ESG metrics within it because if it's going to affect cost of capital, then surely it's going to affect uh, valuations. And lastly, I mean, there are lots of government things like the shareholders rights directive in Europe, um, which I may add the UK uh, 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 is included within that, at least at the moment. Um, you know, most fund managers are having to opt out of the shareholder rights directive, which they can do at the moment in the mining space because there isn't enough sufficient data. That's not gonna be available for much longer. So all of this is, a, is in a kind of cauldron of saying, this is coming down the line. If it's not hitting you now, it's going to hit you. It's going to either improve your chance of getting funding, or obviously if you don't embrace ESG, it's definitely going to have an impact on the, on the availability of where you can go. Yeah, I think one of the, the um images you drew for me when we spoke last week was that there, there are already plane loads of cash flying over the mining industry. And <laughs> there, are, there are going to be more planes and they're going to have more cash on them. And so unless we really get the ESG picture mm -hmm. together and really become credible um, and transparent. Well, this, this, this is the most exciting part of it. To me, you know, once you start dealing with what's going on the ground, but you look at this mining space, this jet stream of ESG, green money, whatever you want to call it, impact investing money is massive. And the opportunity to tap into that is, is huge. But we as an industry need to come together. We need to embrace ESG. If we can embrace ESG, we get better practice. If we get better practice, you get credible and you can marry that with credible tracking. Every single ESG fund that I've spoken to have said, um, give us a reason to buy the mining industry and give us a credible means to track the mining companies individually. If, if we get that, then we can start to begin to invest in the mining industry. So if you can get better practice and you get credible tracking, that gives you better perception. You get better perception, you get greater confidence. And with greater confidence, you've got new pools of capital to go to. And without a doubt, the biggest re-rating of a sector in certainly my generation must be the mining industry over the next 10 to 15 years because uh, of we're at the bottom of the pile at the moment and there's no reason, particularly given the products that we are going to provide, uh, why we could not be halfway up that. But we've got to give society, we've got to give fund management, we've got to give capital, we've got to give local stakeholders the confidence, the support, the data, the evidence, the transparency to allow them to be able to track and, and have confidence in this industry as a whole that... Uh, um, that we, we, that we are who we are, that we, we, we can be a better 
industry than we have been perceived in the past. Like it's nice, nice to end on an aspirational message, which is. Which is <laughs> <laughs> I truly believe it. I really do believe it. Yeah, and, and I think you know this is a good point actually to flip to a couple of questions um, from from the audience, and actually the one when the first one kind of picks up on on one of your last points there, which is, and you know how does the the Digby ESG uh, let's call it an approach as opposed to the technology right now. Mm -hmm. um, help engage local stakeholders, you know, getting, getting really down to the ground level there. Yeah, I think that's a great question because we talk all about the, you know, the financial side, but at the end of the day, these projects, you know, either are next door or very much involved with local stakeholders. The most important thing is this data is free. To, so the mm. corporate pays and the, uh, anybody else is then able to access this information for free on an ad hoc basis. So, uh, I think it's fair to say that most local uh, stakeholders will now have access to the internet and therefore they can just go online. It's free to access. And it's not there at the moment because we only launched a few months ago, but once these companies start to uh, publish their scores um, and go forward, then you'll be able to have a look just like a young person in Vancouver might want to look at the scores. Local stakeholders can get in and they can go into as much granularity as they like. They can just see the global, the overall score, or they can go into the individual questions. They can see, you know, how they're doing on water or how they're doing on social engagement. And one of the great questions, Mark, uh, in, in, the, in the frameworks is, do you have a social, uh, social media strategy? And, and what is that social media strategy saying? So it's very much part, uh, local stakeholders are a really important part of uh, um, ensuring the transparency and process that this can work forward. Okay. No, it's, it's interesting because I, I can envision a future now where stakeholders will be able to ask much more informed questions as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it won't mm -hmm. just, it, it, they'll be able to get beyond the generic questions and really drill in. So exactly what are you doing with respect to water and why did you move from a 10 to a 20 to just pick an arbitrary number? Um, and and, and how, how will we see an improvement? One of the, the, the panel I did last month, one of the, the great examples was, you know, if you're gonna buy paper clips, why not buy them locally? Um, instead of buying your paper clips and having them Absolutely. ship, you know, it's something you're gonna need in the office or where do you buy your ballpoint pens from? And so the more that we can connect those sort of those local decisions to, the way that um, they're reflected in these, these reports makes a big difference. And local procurement is a major part of the, uh, of the general, uh, uh, of the question set. Um, not just for now, because we all know that sometimes the now is impossible, but it's where does management want to ultimately get there? And therefore, with that transparency, local communities can say, okay, well, clearly we need to invest in this area or that area. And then suddenly, you know, you've got a you got a matching of minds. Right. Um, another question that's come, come in is, you know, we everything we've been talking about is around uh, tracking and getting your way through the, the process and, and the framework that you guys use, making it simpler and more, more efficient. Um, but what about the sort of the planning and the what do I do next? Um, are you guys also able to help companies figure out a plan as opposed to just track what's going on right now? Yeah. Um, so if you see it as an assessment, so if the, the, the report comes back after it's been. Uh, so the one thing that I didn't touch on, which is really important, is the obligation on directors is becoming really is becoming really big. The requirement to do ESG uh, or to, to consider ESG is not just a print is currently principles based in Canada, UK and Australia, and it's becoming regulatory. So this addresses that. And the reason I say that is that once it's gone through the um, the board of directors for sign off, uh, which is an important element of this. Uh, it then comes to us for scoring. When it comes back from scoring, there is a report. And that report, some of which, assuming the company is beyond its first year and has decided you know, is therefore public, uh, some of that stuff will automatically go onto the, uh, um, onto the platform for people to see the scores, et cetera. But there will be a big report which goes back to the company. And in that, there's an executive summary, there's a uh, uh, clarity of the positives versus negatives uh, of the overall report. Um, and then there's the individual areas, whether it's water, whether it's um, uh, social, or all the different areas where there is a, a, the other assessment has had comments on it. So out of that, you can get it, but obviously you may then want to also go and use a, um, 
an ESG consultant to manage that process over the course of the following year before you get to that next assessment. But yes, the report, uh, either in narrative or graphical through a tornado chart, uh, you can immediately see where you're a little bit weak. And we also include a Zoom call with the assessor immediately after the scoring, not to negotiate the score, uh, but to um, but but to try and help them identify areas with which they can uh, with which they can improve on over the following year. Uh, and I think that's an important element again to try and help uh, companies, uh, particularly those which may have limited resources. Okay. And, and if a company is not quite ready to commit to this, you know, you, I think one of the things that you're doing that's so neat is that that most of what's available out there is for is is free with Digby. You know, in terms of, of looking at the data, it's really the core activity that you're charging for, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, but if you know, how can companies start to use the free framework to even just get their house in order before they even walk in the door? So that's that's I, I I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, so right from the beginning, you know, this was all aimed when it was really started from these institutional investors a year ago is how can we help this industry get over this bump of ESG and then move it positively forward. So it was, it was really important from our point of view to, um, to, to, to make it easy for them. And it's, it's not easy at the moment just until we get past the beta test. So bear with us, anybody who wants to do this, but just reach out to us and we can give you the instructions to get on. But it's effectively, you can go straight on. You don't need to ring us up and ask for a demo or anything else like that. You can just sign up, get onto it, and then put your team members in, uh, which may be a consultant, and you can give them certain permissions. Could be four or five of you. And all of, certainly the first two frameworks, exploration and development, are not, uh, sorry, are designed to be handled internally in the group. Um, mm -hmm. You may okay. well want a consultant to help you move on, but the idea is to not have to burden a company with more and more uh, costs. And then from that, um, uh, once you put your team and you've made sure your assets uh, are, are in the software, then effectively you will be given a, 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 the, 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 the frameworks appropriate to your company and your projects. And you can use that completely for free. There's no cost whatsoever. You can go in, you can put all the answers in, you can submit the evidence to support it all the way up through and including going to your board of directors where you get a nice PDF. It goes up to your board of directors for discussion, debate, and ultimately uh, approval before it then comes to us. And it's only at that stage when it comes to us for submission uh, do we raise an invoice. Okay, well, that's great. And I can, I can attest firsthand, I signed up I said I signed up people from our organization. I've been through the process, so I wanted to to, to test this before we we spoke. Um, Jamie, this has been a great discussion. It's and, and I think that um, what I I like so much about the Digby story is that it's it's really grounded in this notion of how do we take an industry that kind of sits at the bottom of the rankings table right now in terms of perception of of environmental, social, and governance record, and how do we move it up, but not just from a a scorekeeping perspective, how do we actually move the needle in a meaningful way and make sure that the various companies are being recognized for the good efforts they're putting in, but also figuring out how to do better um, and, and really giving that yardstick. So um, been a great discussion. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I encourage anybody to check out the Digby tool as, as Jamie mentioned, it is free and it's really interesting. It's kind of neat to just go through the maps and, and start to plot things out and see how it all comes together. Well, Mark, thank you so much indeed for, 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 for such an engaging discussion. Uh, thank you, Anthony and, and the Northern Miner team for, for, for this. And, you know, if anybody wants to have a one-on-one -on -one presentation or, or discussion, then uh, just reach out and uh, we, can, we, can, we can manage that. So uh, no problem at all and look Great. forward to... People should definitely to. take you up on that offer, Jamie. It is a really powerful platform. I've been on this well. Thanks to Mark for helping get us set up. Um, I, Jamie, I just had one quick follow-up question, just because I know our audience, we have a lot of uh, junior uh, minors as part of our audience. You mentioned about taking off that burden, uh, like the way you, at the end there, just kind of laid out what's involved in getting their information in there. But I can uh, I can imagine what they're thinking, which is how long does this take? So if you, if you have a ballpark, yeah. if you're an average junior minor, with a flagship asset, you know, your market cap's around $80 million. You got a flagship, maybe you got a couple other assets somewhere else. How long does it take to get that initial stage to actually get that information in there? We're kind of guiding, it's a good question, Anthony, but we're kind of guiding 
to get it from the day you kind of sign up to the moment you submit it to us, depending on how long your board of directors might want to debate over it. But assuming that's a one day thing rather than a, uh, uh, they take a week over it, then we, we, we're saying it will probably take you a couple of weeks. It won't be full two weeks. You could do it in a couple of hours. Literally, I promise you, you could go through this and some, you guys have seen some of the questions. Some of these questions are really straightforward because out of the uh, 45, 50 uh, project questions, there are 25 corporate questions, about 45, 50 project questions, 50% of them are context-based, which we didn't actually uh, get to talk about, but every project is put into a context so that when you do compare and contrast, uh, you can look at them on an apples to apples basis. And so those context-based questions are really quite straightforward. Uh, you know, you don't need to prove you're next to a glacier or a river, it's pretty, just pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. There are some questions which are a bit more detailed, but if you assume two weeks with somebody doing it, um, I think you would do it well within that. And I don't think it would be full time within that either. I'd be able to come up with more data and we'll share that on the, on the social media as more and more companies go through it. Um, we've got about 25 clients going through it at the moment. Uh, we've got about 10 companies signed up for the uh, development framework, but which we're not actually yet um, uh, live with. So we'll have more data over the course of the next three or four months. And then we're guiding three weeks for scoring at the moment after that. Um, but we want to get that down to below two weeks uh, once we've just got a bit more uh, um, time on that. So five weeks in total is what I think. A small amount of time to pay considering what the uh, potential impact is both for individual companies and as you've me and Mark pointed out to the industry as a whole. Excellent conversation, both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. It's uh, And congratulations on how you've been developing this, Jamie. We look forward to seeing how Digby continues to uh, progress and grow at scale. Thank you. Well, collaborative approach from many, many people. And thank you both indeed uh, for all of your help. Awesome. Cheers. Thank you. Bye, both.